Thanks, Dad. Oh. <laughs> I get it now. <laughs> That's your nickname, huh? <laughs> so, are we supposed to talk in those? that when we talk about the stuff we do, like how many we are plus the stuff we do? Okay. Okay. And then we can see them behind, yeah? So I think we'll probably just get started. Okay, the light changed. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Uh, so we're going to get started now. Uh, this is a session talking about um, BuzzFeed International. And uh, so my name is Craig Silverman. I'm the editor of BuzzFeed Canada. Uh, we also have two other editors of international editions from BuzzFeed here. Um, what we're going to do is we're each going to give a really quick overview of a basic intro of our uh, editions. Then we're going to show you an examples of some of the stuff we've been doing. Uh, and then we're going to have sort of a discussion about the way that BuzzFeed is translating and adapting content from one country to others and how we're all trying to learn from what each other is doing around the world to build kind of a global network. Uh, and then we'll, we'll obviously uh, leave time for questions and make sure that we're done promptly at four. So, uh, I'm going to start very quickly. Um, again, I, I edit BuzzFeed Canada. We're pretty new. We launched in June of last year. Um, we are a bit unique in BuzzFeed International because we launched with uh, uh, some people doing news, and we also launched with people doing what we call Buzz, which is sort of the traditional BuzzFeed content of lists and quizzes, um, not journalistic content, not news, but the kind of content that people love to share. Uh, and so our editorial team now in Canada is 10 people. We have three people in business as well. Um, and uh, one of the other unique things about Canada is that even before we launched, there was actually quite a large amount of traffic going from Canada to BuzzFeed because Canada and the US, we share so much in terms of language and culture that Canadians were already very familiar with BuzzFeed. And so our mandate from day one has been to do Canadian stuff by Canadians for Canadians in the BuzzFeed style, but also, of course, to try and, and break news as much as possible. Um, I'm going to show, if we can go to the slides here, I'm going to just show you some examples of the stuff we're doing in Canada. So this was, this is one of the biggest stories um, we've had. Uh, it's almost three million views. There was a raccoon that was dead on the street in Toronto, and over time, people started putting flowers and cards, and somebody actually made a photo and printed it off and put it there. People started signing condolence cards, and over the span of like 16 hours throughout a day, um, you know, people, there was a hashtag and people were talking about it. And so, so I collected all of that into a story and actually the raccoon, finally the city picked it up late at night and there, was, there happened to be somebody there like videotaping it. So we have the life and the death of this raccoon on the street. And this went globally viral. It was very popular in Canada, but it went right around the world. Um, this, this is, uh, that's sort of a, what we call a social news post, something that actually happened. This is an example of a buzz post where we collected sort of funny conversations about Canada on, uh, on Tumblr. This was about, we actually do this thing where we take maple syrup, we put it in the snow, and then we eat it, which for people not from Canada seems insane, apparently. So, uh, so this did really well. Um, this is uh, what we call a, a frame, sort of an approach that was, has been done around the world, where what if Harry Potter was set in different countries? And so then you, you, know, you come up with different things that would be different, and like, for example, one of the things we said is that all of the letters Harry got from Hogwarts would have been lost by Canada Post because they're completely incompetent. Um, and uh, so the other thing, we do a lot of fun group projects. So for April Fool's Day, we decided to only publish content about Nickelback. Uh, and so for the entire day, you were not allowed to publish anything unless it was about Nickelback. Um, and we even had a special Chad Ramen Hair badge created 
for all of the content, um, but this was the best piece of the day for sure. Uh, <laughs> So this is, again, this is something that has been done globally around BuzzFeed if Disney princesses were Canadian or were this or that. So we did if Disney princesses were Chad Kroger, and it's a nightmare. Um, so that's sort of the more fun stuff. We do, we do serious news. Um, these are two stories that we broke. The one on top was during the election about a member of parliament who was out drinking with underage women at a bar, bought them drinks, and then someone connected to the candidate tried to bribe them to take down all their social media photos. So we broke that story. Um, it got a lot of attention, a lot of views. He ended up losing his seat, not just from that, but it, it had some effect. Second story, one of our reporters interviewed former drone operators from the Canadian military about what they went through and the post-traumatic stress they suffer. Um, and that's the first time anyone had, had sort of gotten to them and talked to them. Um, and then this was a story that yesterday was nominated for an award from the Canadian Association of Journalists. Um, looking at the connections between the Prime Minister and the discovery of a shipwreck uh, and a whole bunch of, basically the, the person who got credit, partial credit for discovering it wasn't actually there when it was discovered. And so this was a feature we worked on with a freelancer who was a Pulitzer Prize winner who quit a newspaper to be able to pursue the story. Uh, and then the last thing is, this is one we published recently, a photo essay by a Syrian refugee who experienced his first Canadian winter. And he learned to take photos in a, in a refugee camp in Lebanon, and so we commissioned him to document his uh, first Canadian winter. Um, the other thing that's notable about him is he's a photographer, but he's legally blind. So he's, he has a really interesting story and a really interesting perspective. And this did, you know, the, like it didn't do millions of views, but it, it did really well, as have some of the other ones that we talked about. Um, so that's a little bit about what we do at BuzzFeed Canada. I had, I had to do a GIF, and it's Celine. Um, so that's Canada. Let's talk about Spain. Um, okay. Can you hear me? I don't know. Uh, no. There you go. Can you hear me now? Okay. Uh, we are one of the latest editions of BuzzFeed, along with uh, Japan. Uh, we've been around since uh, late November uh, last year, and uh, we are a small team. We are four people, including me. Uh, Ah, my name is Alfredo Murillo. <laughs> I'm the editor of, for Russia Spain. I'm sorry. Um, uh, the thing is that right now we are a small team. We are doing only bus. Uh, difference with what Craig told about Canada. Uh, we are following the classical um, international edition bus feed steps, which is uh, launching just with bus content uh, because this is probably the best way to grow because you are making content that people want to share and you're focusing on create content that people want to share. Uh, right now we are two staff writers, myself, and uh, an illustrator and a graphic designer who is doing uh, distributed for us, which is we, not, we think that is really important right now. Uh, it's something that uh, on Basque International, we think that it's, it's uh, something that we have to focus on distributed. It's something that all the editions are doing it right now. So it felt like, um, like a good idea to have somebody doing it from the start, to have an illustrator from the start. Uh, what we are doing right now, well, is that kind of content that everyone knows uh, BuzzFeed for, uh, especially in Spain. When we first started in Spain, uh, BuzzFeed was popular, but was still not a brand in Spain. Most, there was a lot of people that uh, may have uh, read uh, BuzzFeed big stories, but they, if, you, if you say BuzzFeed, actually they, they cannot even pronounce BuzzFeed. Uh, I, I have a hard time say, saying where I work. Uh, <laughs> my, mar, my mom doesn't know where I work, actually. Um, <laughs> but right now our, our focus is to, to make people to know what we are doing and what BuzzFeed is. So we are doing it, we are doing that uh, using a lot of identity posts, like appealing to, to something that people want to share, that people feel connected to, that kind of content that people uh, feel that relate to them. And also, do, uh, with the, situ the politics situation in Spain, we find out that it was a good thing to do, even though we don't know, we don't have uh, a news team right now. Uh, it was a, a good thing to do, just mix politics with bass content, with his humor content. So it's something that it's, it's been working really good in Spain right now, but the thing is that we've been only around for four months now, so the pool is still too small to, to talk about what is really working or what is not working, because um, 
there is a lot of of, of experimenting uh, to do still to do. So we will see. And that's, uh, that's do you want to show? Oh, this? Okay, yeah. Uh, if we could get the slides up again. Yeah, please. Okay, as I told you, we are a, we are a small team, so we we do a lot of adaptation and translation. Uh, we we do that for two reasons mainly. Uh, the first reason is to have more content and have uh, quality content because uh, when we pick up uh, some some posts that are working really well in another country, we know that is because. Uh, that, that post has a really good quality and it's gonna work uh, also in Spain. And also, as we are a small team, we, we cannot do everything. So we use it also to test new content that we, we cannot do ourselves. And we want to know how it's gonna perfor perform in Spain because we don't have any reference. So we just use um, adapted or translated content that doesn't, doesn't take a lot of our time. Uh, we can see uh, what our audience wants, really. Uh, we, we do, here's two examples. Uh, the, the first one, for example, we realize that the, the Spanish audience has a, lot of, has a lot of things in common with the UK audience. It's something that uh, surprises us because at the beginning, we thought that we will have more in common with countries like Mexico or with uh, the Espanol team that we share the same language. But we found out the, 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 the frames and the topics that performs really well in UK, they also perform really well in Spain. So what we do is not only translating the, the content, but also adapting some of them so the, the Spanish people feel like that content speaks directly to them. Um, and also, uh, there is uh, this chain where we adapt content from some, some other country, and then it performs well in our country. For example, we adapt this map, that is a stere stereotypes map. We, we took the idea from the UK, and it performed really well in Spain. So then, for example, it's something that uh, France did it in their edition too, and it worked really well. So it's like, uh, what I'm trying to, to show, show you is that uh, the connection between what, uh, the work we do and how uh, everything that other edition does has a really big impact in what we are doing because especially when the team is as small as we are, that we are using the other editions as a resource for the work we're doing right now. Is it me? Yeah, yeah. Okay. sure. I don't know if there is other person. It's okay. Um, Go ahead. Did yeah, you want to well, talk about this? Yeah, it's, it's, it's the same thing. Well, you can see here examples from Mexico to Spain. That is an adaptation. The, we just use the same frame. But as you can see, the, the similarities are, are, uh, are great. And there is from Canada. As, as I told you, we are not doing politics as per se because we don't have a news team. But this kind of idea that worked really well in Canada that was like, taking some serious politics uh, topic and just transform mm -hmm. it into something fun, something that everyone wants to, wants to read about. We took the idea from there because uh, we thought that it really suits in the, in the Spanish situation right now. People is like a little bit tired of all the, the politics news. It, there's a lot of changes. So it was a really good idea from Canada that we thought that will feed uh, really good in, in, in our content and it did actually. Um, hi, so I'm Cecile de Esdan and I'm the editor-in-chief for BuzzFeed Friends. Um, BuzzFeed Friends was launched at the end of 2013 with only Buzz content and two people on staff. And then uh, we grew the team a whole lot last year. We went from two people to ten people, which is what we are right now. And we have half uh, news and half Buzz. Um, and the idea was to basically talk more, um, be a bigger part of the French media conversation in both light and more serious topics. So as you can see from our examples, uh, a big part of Buzz is really uh, targeting it to your country and your culture, making sense of what the identities or the humor is. So in France, we have very, str Ooh, sorry. <laughs> very strong regional identities. 
This on the, on the left is one of our, is, I think it's our biggest post ever. It's now over a million views. It's 30 reasons never to go to Bretagne, Brittany. It's an ironic post uh, only with amazing pictures of Brittany which makes you want to go there directly. And Bretagne people are a very proud uh, part of France and this did really well for them, uh, w for us with them. And then on your right you have stuff about school, Nostalgia about school. Uh, the bottom one is uh, um, the struggles that people who hate people know. And this is another thing like we found that in America, uh, awkward is a very strong identity. But in France, hating people and being an asshole is a very strong identity. So <laughs> the stuff we do about hating people or a connard is our awkward. And I think it changes with every country. You have your different. Um, strong identities, yeah. And then uh, another part of Buzz is um, finding a new way of talking about subjects that um, are maybe usually talked in a very serious way. So this is, if we talked to men the way we talk to women, then you have sentences black people don't want to hear ever again, uh, cliches and stereotypes, uh, that the LGBTQ community doesn't want to hear again. And here are sentences that everyone doing Ramadan is so fed up uh, with having to answer, questions they ha they're fed up with having to answer. And this for us is also a way of, uh, in a lighter, easier, uh, different way, talk about stuff that our readers go through and that other media either don't talk about or only talk about in a very um, serious and I guess like yeah very serious way and this is for us this is a way of saying like we hear you <laughs> you are here <laughs> and we we can understand what you're going through um, and then in terms of news so I pull like some different I now realize this is all in French and so not very useful to you <laughs> but I wanted to show the different sort of stuff we do so we have uh, social news which is basically people uh, getting on the internet and finding stories on the internet on social media on blogs on Facebook etc and then reporting it with the same tenacity and uh, rigor that um, other journalists report like more traditional stuff with. So um, it's like the, so it's, it's um, a way for us to get stories that other people are not covering basically. We're a small news team, so our goal is always be where the others are not or advance the story some way because if not, you will not come through basically. Um, you can switch, sure. I think. And then, yeah, a big part of our news stuff is debunking. Um, because we have social news reporters who basically live on the internet, uh, and because there is so many fake stuff going around, we try to do, whenever we see uh, something that's being widely shared that's not true, to fact check it, to debunk it. So the first one on the top left, you may have seen it because it was in so many languages. The story of that dolphin that was uh, supposedly killed by people taking selfies, like take, people taking selfies with the dolphin as it was dying. And um, a lot of media picked it up and we, we didn't. We took some more time to like check it and had the story later that day that actually the dolphin was already dead, which I mean, you can argue taking a selfie with a dead dolphin is a very weir weird thing to do. I will not <laughs> say the opposite, but it was not the story that everyone had been telling. And then just on the bottom left is our um, a Twitter account that's called Verifié, which means verified or checked. It's run by us. And basically that's where we do a lot of debunking. Sometimes we do it on the website and sometimes we just make a tweet or an image. That's what uh, Alfredo was talking about with distributed stuff that can live on the internet, not necessarily on BuzzFeed.com, the website. Um, and we also share stuff from other French media doing great debunking. So the idea is to be directly where the rumors are spreading instead of trying to get people necessarily to come to the site. Okay, so that's a, a quick overview of the three editions that we're running. Um, so as you can tell, there's a big effort uh, and it's getting bigger and bigger at BuzzFeed overall to translate and adapt and to learn things of what works in one place and see if we can make it work in other places. 
Um, and uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> well, so there's a team that's dedicated to this, and uh, this this was actually just shared internally at BuzzFeed. So since October until the end of February, they've translated more than 2,000 posts. Uh, into five different languages. And we also have a translation operation running for video. So this is, um, it's a pretty big operation. And what we see is that obviously, this is an, like one example here, where there was, um, uh, uh, it was a million and a half views. It originated in English and then another million and a half views for a particular story came from getting it into a bunch of other editions quickly. So there's a traffic benefit, but overall like a big thing is learning. and. So because I run an English edition, I actually, we don't do a lot of translation and adaption. Like I sometimes see my stuff end up in Japanese or what have you, but like, uh, you know, for you guys, maybe it would be helpful to like explain to folks here what it's like for you. Like, do you see something on another edition and say, oh, that will work in France or in Spain? Um, how do you get notified? Like, what does the process look like? Do you want me to? So, um, yeah, we translate and adapt a lot of things, and there are several ways from which we get them. Uh, we use Slack a lot. Does and everyone knows what Slack is? It's a, an internal messaging uh, application, basically, that a lot of businesses, especially in media and tech, use, that allows you to talk to everyone, chat, and stuff like that. Um, and so you can have rooms d dedicated to a topic and we have room dedicated to adaptations where one, someone on the team uh, in New York will be like, hey, Alfredo, Cecile, this did super well in English and in German. I think it would do well in French and Spanish. Do you want it? Or we will say, hey, Millie, Hi, Millie, <laughs> in New York. Uh, I saw this was doing super well in Japanese. I have no idea what this means. Please help me. Can, should we have it? What is it saying? Can we, can we work with this? Um, so we do that. Then there's also all the stuff that we spot on yeah. the website that we'll just send. Yeah, I think that also the thing, the thing that we are always connected between editions, uh, we know what is working on each edition. So it is easy for us to say like, hey, Cecil, I think this will fit perfectly in what uh, the audience wants in France, or or to do that. For example, I, I, we have a, a, a strong relationship with Espanol in Mexico because of the language. Um, so it's easy for us and for them to know what is going to work for us. So we are always like uh, saying each other what is what we think can work in their editions. Yeah, and every week we we have an email about the especially about the buzz posts that did well all over the world. That's basically like a list of stuff you may or may not have seen throughout your week, and that you're thinking, oh, I didn't, ha I never saw that frame. It did super well in Spain. Let me try it in French, for example. Um, when so one of the things that and I'm wondering is if editions that launch in different countries there's a different understanding of BuzzFeed or no understanding of BuzzFeed when you launch. And in some cases, we've launched an international edition and like the existing media in that country is like, what the hell is this? What's going on? So I'm wondering, maybe we should each say sort of what the, the sort of reception was when we first launched. Alfredo, do you want to uh, go? Well, I think that uh, the, the thing is that we, we launched uh, yeah, four months ago. So there was already a lot of media in Spain doing uh, the same thing that BuzzFeed International was doing. So for us, the frames we were using, the classical BuzzFeed frames, were already being used by other media. So for us, we, the, the, the thing we want to focus on was to, to let the, the audience know that we had that, that frames, that we, we know how to use it, and we, that we can twist that frame so they, they won't be bothered and they won't be tired of it. So that was probably the, the, the situation when we first launched. It was not just uh, letting people know that, we, hey, we are here, we've launched in Spain, we're creating content uh, from Spain to the Spanish audience. It was also to say, like, uh, we are not going to give you what everyone is giving to you. Uh, we're going to do what we do, but we're going to twist it a little bit so, so you, can, you can see that we know how to, how to, um, how to um, use this kind of, of content. What was the reception in France? Um, so I wasn't at BuzzFeed when the, the BuzzFeed Friends first launched, so I, I can't really talk to that, though I remember that the presentation at Sciences Po was a bit, it was a bit of a cold atmosphere. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but when I, when I arrived, I mean, one easy thing, I guess, for me was that I was 
uh, hiring new people to have a full, full team. Um, so doing lots of new things. So people were, I think the reception was mostly excited. And then, like, I think French, French media at least knows that uh, BuzzFeed does news and buzz. Um, mm. They like to forget it sometimes. <laughs> um, but it's also, it's more, it's more a thing of what, what I spend the most time, I think, telling my team is we can't, we can't convince people that Buzz and News live well together. We can't like talk to them until they agree. We just have to show them by doing the best content that we can every day. And explaining that to us, it's not like an opposition, which mm -hmm. French media, and I think a lot of media everywhere yeah. have a hard time. Yeah. Like a lot of people think that it's uh, contrary to have both News and Buzz, and I don't think so. And I think all the stuff that we're doing every day shows it and proves it. And then you can just you know do the work and have people change their mind or not, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? Like that's yeah. all you can do, do the best work every day. With, with us in Canada, when I, because, you know, I mentioned it before, there was already actually a lot of traffic going from Canada to BuzzFeed because the stuff that was being produced in the US was still resonating with Canadians. Uh, and so for us, I think in some ways the reception was, some people almost felt it was overdue. They're like, because for Canada, like, we, because of the relationship with the US, we, we want to feel validated of like big US brands and companies coming to Canada. Um, like, and, and if they come and they don't give us what we want, then we get really upset because it's like, oh, you're not treating us like a real country, you know? We're like the 51st state. So, so for us, it was almost like, finally you're here. Um, and we launched with news and buzz at the same time because we wanted to show that, that it was like, it was kind of a full offering coming to Canada. We weren't just gonna do a, like a couple of people. So we had six people when we launched. One of the things that, that I learned on launch day um, is, so we have a homepage which we can curate and anyone who comes to buzzfeed.com from Canada, the IP address is redirected to a Canadian homepage. And on launch day, we like loaded up the homepage with all the Canadian stuff we had been producing for a few weeks so that people came to the homepage and it was like tons of Canadian buzz and Canadian news and people hated it. <laughs> uh, and because they were like, what did you do to my BuzzFeed? Uh, because they liked the US stuff. And so what we learned, like we, we fixed this very quickly because they were like tweeting at us and stuff, is that you know what they still want the BuzzFeed they liked before, but what they want to see is more and more Canadian stuff coming into it, but like not completely replacing the stuff that they loved from the US. Um, so like that was something we totally, like I screwed up on the first day and we, we were able to fix it very quickly because we got lots of very angry tweets. Uh, and realize that yes, of course, they already like this stuff. Um, it, it, so tell me what you guys have screwed up since, <laughs> since I just confessed something. Wow. Or, or one wow. thing that you expected to happen that you were sort of surprised the way it turned out. Why are you putting us on the yeah. spot? <laughs> like, well, that's, oh, that's oh my, my job right now. <laughs> Well, let me think. Um, something that I screwed, I, I screwed up a lot of, a lot of times to <laughs> four months. Uh, but uh, one particular thing, I think that at the beginning we thought, uh, well, people, uh, what, what Craig said about the IP in Spain, uh, when you when you went to BuzzFeed, it directly went to to BuzzFeed Español, which is based in New York and is. Uh, um, it's written for all Latin America. So the thing was that at the beginning we thought that people from Spain were gonna, were gonna reject that. And that was my, my misconception that I thought that that was gonna happen. So we tried to separate it like, okay, we want for people to know that BuzzFeed Spain is not BuzzFeed Espanol and just so let them know that we are two different editions. And after four months, I realized that people want two editions together. I think that people really want to see in the Facebook uh, timeline, they, they, in the Facebook feed, they like to see a post from BuzzFeed Espanol and post, post from BuzzFeed Spain, and they don't really care about the differences of the language, they don't really care about different, the cultural differences because um, there's, uh, I, I think there's something bigger than that that speaks to them uh, no matter what. So uh, for me that was like, okay, maybe you, you've been doing that wrong. Maybe you thought that, that People won't like that, but actually they, they proved me wrong. Right now I, I understand that that's the kind of content that they like and, mm -hmm. and it's, some, it's about uh, joining forces instead of, of separating them. That's what all this is about actually. 
Um, and I think we screwed up at the beginning by, n by thinking that just translating would be enough. And by that I mean by basically <laughs> just translating the sentences from English to French would be enough. And that is not the case. I think we used to think about um, translations as like an easy way for us to have more, more posts published per day without like thinking quantity instead of thinking quality and why are we translating this or not that. And that has shifted radically like in the past, I would say, I don't know, six months, four months or something, um, where we've been paying more and more attention to translations. And uh, that's, you know, part of Millie's job and all her team of global adaptation and translation. Because it's two things. It's one, sometimes you have to completely rewrite, especially with Buzz. With news, yeah. it's more like taking mm -hmm. stuff out and adding stuff in. In Buzz, sometimes it's full of uh, words play in English that makes no sense whatsoever in French and you have to like switch your humor. Or, <laughs> please don't hate me American friends for that, but a lot of American posts are very cheesy. <laughs> very, very cute. There's French no Americans people. up here, we can yeah, say whatever we want. they're listening, they're on the <laughs> internet, I know it. Uh, French people are not cute, like, <laughs> obviously. So not, not so much, not very big with the cheese and I mean, with the cheese, yes, not with the cheesy. Oh, and that's I see. Canada. I see. I see. Canada loves I see where we're going stuff. with this. Okay. <laughs> so there was a lot of like, okay, let me take a little bit out and French it more. And even in the gifts and stuff like that, the images, mm -hmm. replacing them. Like, yeah. there are references to nostalgia TV shows in the US we've never had in France. You have to spot them and realize that that is enough for a person to not recognize their experience when they read it. And if they don't see themselves represented, why would they share it with a friend? Mm -hmm. Because they, they don't have a common experience to share with. So I think that was the thing that we changed a lot and now we're right. moving more and more to adaptation, like Alfredo was saying. Uh, by the way, Celine gifts work all around the world. I just want to <laughs> that say is that. True. I always forget she's <laughs> yeah. Canadian. That she's uh, ours? Maybe she's How French. How dare you? you. <laughs> um, so, uh, so I think we should talk a little bit about uh, distributed because it's come up a couple times and it's obviously, it's been, I know it's been a big focus for us in Canada. So when we say distributed, we mean producing things that just live on social networks that don't go to our website at all. Uh, and so in Canada, you know, our social media editor spends a decent amount of time of his day searching for stuff that can just go on Facebook and just go on Twitter and, and, and you know, the biggest reach of posts we've ever had are not link posts on Facebook, they're like, you know, a hilarious GIF or, you know, just, uh, just even like little, uh, you know, screenshots of a funny tweet or something like that. So, um, so for us, like, distributed is, is more and more of something that we're working on. Um, for you guys, like, Alfredo, you said you have, you hired somebody for illustration skills. Yeah. Um, what, do, what are you guys doing and sort of learning from that? Well, actually, he, he's uh, an illustrator and senior designer, but he proved that he can do almost everything because he can write too, and now he's learning to do video, so it's like, oh my God, he's like <laughs> the, best, the best hire we've had. Um, the thing is that we, we, as we want to grow right now, we are focusing on that because it's, it's in a very early stage of, of the project. Um, so we felt that that was the natural thing to do, just to go where people is and just uh, give them what, what it's, what is going to be the most engaging thing that they're going to see on, on social media. So um, he's working mainly on illustration. He's also coordinating uh, the, the adaptation and translation for illustration and video, mm -hmm. and he's he's working also with with this older Spanish editions. Uh, but mainly, what we are doing is illustration and video. One thing that we are doing, and it's proven that it's it's go, it's working really well, is um, because uh, putting uh, the our best performance post into video, just transforming those posts into video, and just put it on Facebook or put it on Twitter. It's another way to to give the content that we have already created uh, cross-platform and, and just give it to people so, so they can see if, it, if they have not seen in, in, in our website because it doesn't make sense to, to have people come into our website to see something that we, we can show them in, other, in another way. That's what, that's what I think Distributed is all about, is just going to where people is. So right now we are really focusing on that, mainly because we, we want to grow and I think distributed is probably the, the best way to do that. 
Yeah, I agree. I think it just goes to, like, one of BuzzFeed's main um, principles is basically go where the readers are. So, uh, like, a lot of thing, a lot of things that we do or a lot of our strategy comes from that. Go where the readers are and talk with them there instead of trying forcefully <laughs> to bring them to you. Uh, and that, that can mean uh, lots of different things. That's mm -hmm. why some of our stuff we just put. Some stuff is not worth for us an article, maybe because there will be a very long article, very well done somewhere else that has more views already. Like mm -hmm. if Le Monde is doing an article, why would we do the same? We have no interest in doing that. So we'd rather do like an image th uh, that will sum up something, a graph that will explain a thing um, in a ways that people haven't seen yet and put it on Twitter on, or Facebook where they already are, then um, have them come to the website. And that's like a lot of things that we're doing on video on Facebook too. We just launched our uh, news page on Facebook and we're doing news videos there. And we also just launched our Tasty. Uh, do you right. guys know Tasty? Yeah, the, the recipes. Did you know that Tasty was run by BuzzFeed? Did it, was that commonly known? Yeah. Okay. Because not everyone knows. I, not I, everyone knows. It's not, not labeled as BuzzFeed on Facebook. <laughs> yeah. what, do you want to give background on Tasty a little bit, just what it is? And yeah, so Tasty is, um, is a, an amazing project run by the uh, BFMP, BuzzFeed Motion Pictures team uh, in LA. Um, and they launched Tasty first, for, so in the US, then proper Tasty in the UK, then Tasty de Maish uh, in Brazil, Bien Tasty in Mexico, yeah. and Tasty Miam, which means yummy in French, uh, in France, has just begun. Um, and basically in each country they're working um, with uh, people from the country, so for us it's Marie Telling, who's, uh, who's in New York but who is French, um, on both uh, translating and adapting content from Tasty and creating original for us French recipes. Um, and that's typically an example of a thing that's mostly living on Facebook and Pinterest. Um, yeah, and that's like one of the exciting stuff and people have been asking us a lot about it. <laughs> when is yeah. Tasty Friends happening? So we're happy. Uh, t <coughs> tasty is, is I, f I don't even remember how many fans it has on Facebook, the original one. I think it's 48 like... 48 million. million. Sorry, say that again. <laughs> 48 million. million. Oh my God, I was saying like 15 million <laughs> when I was talking to people. So it's, that's insane. Um, and it's one of the most successful things that BuzzFeed has ever launched and it's only been around for like a little more than a year. And so this is one of the big priorities in international is rolling out tasty franchises around the world. However, Canada is not getting one because already, uh, I know, and I have a great name for it. Do you guys want to hear it? Sorry, Tasty. Tasty, eh? <laughs> Are they all, thank you, thank you for that <laughs> slow clap over there. I just, that's totally what I deserve. Uh, this is like our challenge with Canada because 1.6 million Canadians like that main Tasty page. We're a country of 36 million. There's not a lot of Canadian Facebook pages with 1.6 million likes on it. So they sort of look at it and they say, well, the Canadians are getting what they want and a lot of the ingredients that you see on the main Tasty you could get in Canada. So. We're probably not going to do Tasty A, but I'm just going to say it as many times as I can, and maybe that will make it appear. Um, are they going to do one for you guys? Yeah, yeah, eventually. I think it's coming this year, but first we, we need to grow an editorial before we, we launch the, the Tasty thing. But yeah, it's, it's, in, the, it's in the works. Right? Yeah. yeah. And do you guys find, because Tasty is sort of like it's kind of separate from your editorial team, right? Like you'll have feedback on it to a certain extent. And we were also talking about distributed. Do you guys find like your staff is ever sort of like, well, do people still care about the website at all? Or is that a conversation that hasn't really come up at all? I'm, yeah, go ahead. No, no I, I think that they, they, well, right now, I, mean, I, I talk in the stage we are right now. I don't know if when we grow how, how that conversation will go. But right now, I think we don't have that. I think that there is content that is, is made uh, to live on the website, and there is also other content that is made to live on, on other platforms, and that's okay. I mean, there's there's always room for for every kind of content. Uh, one example, for example, uh, I, I, Marcos, the, our illustrator, sometimes does uh, this kind of post where everything is illustrated. Uh, it never performs really, really well, but when you take those pictures and you put put it, those pictures on Facebook, 
they explode and they have like a lot of engagement. So that that's that's the that's the idea. There, there's some things that are not meant to live on a website, and there's something that are not meant to live directly on social media. So I think that they, they can both uh, live. I, right now, we didn't have that conversation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is, is it, does it come up at all in France where people? No, are not really. I think the whole team, like the whole team, is invested in BuzzFeed succeeding wherever it can and however it can. So when, like everyone, people look at their numbers on the website, but they also look, how did it go on Facebook? Did people comment? Did they tag each other? Did they ask us questions? Should we answer? Like, are there, did someone steal our stuff? Awesome, I mean, I say awesome, <laughs> they're not so happy, but <laughs> it means that it's being spread. So to me, it's always good. Uh, are you know people sharing it? Is it getting impact? There are so many ways of knowing mm -hmm. that what you're doing is succeeding that mm -hmm. I try, like of course, uh, viewers on the website is important, like I'm not saying it's not, but it's becoming more and more one part of a multi-part importance thing. This is not an English sentence, but I hope you understand what I mean. <laughs> yeah, that, that, there's like, there is a larger conversation happening around kind of measurement and impact, where yeah. for a long time it was just traffic to the website, and now we're trying to count total, total views or engagements. And then the other thing, like when I, we have two political journalists in Ottawa covering the federal government in Canada, and like, I don't talk about traffic with them. Um, we sometimes talk about the social lift on their stuff, which is a measurement that BuzzFeed has the percentage of traffic that came to that story from it being shared. And so you can have something that doesn't have a lot of views, but the, all those, like the majority of those views came because it was being shared by people. And like when I talk to our political journalists, I look at their social lift because even if it's not a huge amount of views, it hit an audience and it was shared and it got to them. And then the other thing I have our political journalists do is they have a spreadsheet, or at least they tell me they do this. I ask them to. Um, it, and it, we call it like an impact spreadsheet. So when another news organization follows one of the stories that we break, when people you know, copy our stuff, um, when they get invited onto the radio or whatever to talk about a story that they've done, we put that in there. And that's, you know, for news, that's sort of some of the ways that we quantify. Um, and like obviously that one piece getting up for an award, these are all the things. Is, are these conversations you guys are, I know you don't have news, but for, for you on news, what do you, how do you yeah, guys measure it? Definitely, so I mean, it's a mix of things. Um, I do talk about traffic with news. I, I talk about traffic with everyone because basically my point is, if you're writing and no one is reading, what is the point? Like, you have to care about your readers. You're writing for people and if, you, if you're not, um, if no one is reading you, maybe it means you need to find another approach. Maybe it means it's a tough subject that we need to like find a way to bring to our audience because it's not something they usually read about. So it's not, a, it's not my way of saying, oh, no one will read it, don't write it. It's like, to make people read it, you need to like really find the good idea. And that's like an exciting way of thinking about it. But then we also talk a lot, yeah, about impact. So, it's, um, so it can be when other media pick up our reporting because we got a quote that they didn't or because we right. broke a story that they didn't have. Um, it can, or, or because we did a fun, like cool thing that they're sharing with their audience too. Um, it can be um, also like when there's a, uh, change, uh, can I say the example of the CP cap thing? Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> Why we did, yes. um, we did, uh, we found on Facebook, it was actually, a, so a French person on my team found a Canadian C Quebec uh, parents sharing that there has been mold in CP cups for children. And so he did a post about it, a news post, uh, talked to the brand, did it, okay. Then the, it was picked up in English by our team in English, um, flipped into an English post. So it, it, um, it touched so many more people. And the brand started saying basically, okay, you're just washing it wrong, but okay, we'll tell you how to wash it again and it'll be fine. Then it was picked up, <laughs> that version was translated in Portuguese and in Spanish because the brand of the CP cups was like all over the world. And so it reached so many people, millions of people, and basically by the end of the day, the brand had reversed its course and say, okay, we're gonna like take all of those CP cups back and like make new ones and give them to you for free 
where you can see if it's moldy or not. So, and all of that came from a Facebook post spotted by the team in France and it was impactful all over the world. Mm -hmm. So that was for us a very direct example. And I guess another one would be maybe during the Paris terror attacks that happened um, last winter. Um, the, the French team just, as every, te every news team in France at that moment, worked like crazy people for a week just like doing everything that we could, covering it at the best as we could. And it was a very inspiring moment for us too, to see our stuff being flipped in English and in German and in Spanish and in Portuguese. Because it's, it's always easier in a way to go from English to the other languages since BuzzFeed is a US publication. And so more and more what we're seeing now, and I think that will only grow, yeah. is having um, stuff from the other languages flipped back in English for US, UK, Canadian, Indian, uh, Australian audiences. And that, yeah. made, that made us feel very much part yeah. of a global organization having both local and global impact. Um, all right, so let's take some questions. Do we have questions here? Anybody? I see one in the back. Is there a microphone to give? Or I can just repeat the question if you want. Y yell at me. you convert a strong story into a video and then post it on Facebook? Is it views and sharing natively on Facebook? Are you trying to drive traffic back to that story? Um, right now, uh, we don't care that much about having traffic back. It's just uh, because we, we think that all that we do has to live cross-platform, and that's the interesting thing. So it doesn't, if something has performed well in the website, why, why don't give it to people that maybe don't want to go to the website? autonomous in a lot of ways who like they have people and so what they often do doing new stuff organization how are you defining and measuring growth <laughs> Look at me. okay I'll go first uh, so I mean we there's there's growth in terms of uh, traffic so unique views um, we look more at unique views than page views I would say overall uh, so that's like that's the website um, growth is also in terms of, of our social platforms so in Canada, we, we have a Canadian Tumblr, a Twitter account, Facebook account. We're launching on Pinterest soon. We want to see those accounts growing. And then within them, we look at different kinds of engagement on them. So there's no, there's no one metric. We also look at social lift on the stories we publish. So the growth overall is, you know, are people enjoying our stuff? Are they sharing our stuff? Are they engaging with it? Um, are our channels getting bigger and bigger because we're drawing more people in? And then even within the channels, for example, like we get regular reports about our Facebook page about the percentage of fans of it who are Canadian. And like our percentage is around 75%. Anything else from you? <laughs> yeah. uh, there was one question up front here. There we go. Hi, uh, thanks so much for a great presentation on uh, the editorial content. So it's really interesting to see how you're looking at varying that in different uh, localizations. What about sponsored content? Is that a single strategy internationally or are you also approaching that in a different way in different countries? So it, there's a separation between, we're all, we all work yeah. in editorial as you said, yeah, so editorial. we actually don't have any involvement with sponsored content. Um, you know, like I can say in Canada, because do you guys have business staff at either of yours? No. no. So I'm the only one, we, we have three salespeople in Canada. We have revenue, um, we're profitable as, as an addition right now. Um, but uh, when stuff needs to be produced, the creative, there's a separate creative team um, that does that. And so, and I honestly don't know, uh, I know in the, I would imagine in the UK, which is quite large operation yeah. for us, they would have their own creative team. We don't have our own creative team yet in Canada. Um, but I think as they get bigger, they will hire those creative folks to focus on the sponsor content, but we, we do keep that separation. So we don't know too much about it, yeah. Um, were there any other questions? Another one here, one back there, another one there, okay. Hi, um, what are your top tips for pitching stories to BuzzFeed and practically how to reach you and what kind of content you're looking for? Wait, for which BuzzFeed? Um, any. <laughs> you write in French? <laughs> <laughs> I don't, but I wouldn't mind getting coverage in France. <laughs> Do you work with freelancers? 
Do I what? Do you work with freelancers? Yeah, uh, we work with freelancers. So we work with freelancers mostly in buzz and live content. Um, because we have, because news, the way we do it, except if like someone is pitching me like an exclusive, by the time that we can have it happen, it will be old already compared to, uh, to doing it in-house. Mm -hmm. um, and also because with buzz stuff that is so heavily uh, identity-based, um, that's also, you know, someone from Corsica can be like, hey, I can pitch you stuff about, you know, what it's like living in Corsica that we would never be able to do from Paris because none of us is from Corsica. So the buzz is also a great way, like freelancers in buzz is a great way to have uh, regional identities and work and study differences that we cannot all have in-house. Um, and the way that they do that is that they pitch to Anaïs uh, Bordage in my team, who is uh, in charge of Buzz, and they'll send, sell, send her an email with like five IDs, which are basically like titles. I guess the pitch is the titles, so it will be, I don't know, 20 things that only people who grew up in Corsica know, or stuff like that, and Anaïs will say yes or no and work with them on their draft. What about what? I don't understand. What about pictures from press officers in universities and Oh, like I see. That? From PR folks who Oh, sorry. I thought pitches from a journalist. Oh, okay. I'm I sorry. asked you about freelancers, so okay. it's my fault. Um I don't know. People send us stuff. <laughs> people really like to send us yeah, stuff they, like well, aggressively. Uh, like, yeah, people send us stuff. I would say like just I, I, like I, I cannot know how hard it is to be a PR person and it must be because you have so many things to do, but like trying to really tailor it to BuzzFeed or even to the person you're sending it at BuzzFeed is your best way of having it because sometimes it'll be like, hi BuzzFeed, I think this story will be great for you and it's like a thing we would never cover. So sometimes it feels you're just filling in blanks and that will not work. If you take the time to tailor it, it might work better. I mean, one of the other things I'll say is the policy at BuzzFeed is like we don't go on junkets, so if you're offering us a trip to come check out some place, like we don't do that. If we're going to cover something, we'll pay our own way to do it. Um, and uh, uh, we are allowed to get things that are consumable, so if you want to send us food, we'll <laughs> usually accept that. Uh, so there are like clear rules around that. And, and what I found in Canada is uh, folks in PR will often like they, they, they think that they can sort of collaborate with us. And I'm, I'm not saying that in a sort of adversarial way, but just like they, they don't think, see us as having as much editorial separation at some times. And so like, you know, we're often reply and be really clear, like, you know, if you have an idea, if you have information you want to share with us, that's great, but like we're not going to help you write something together with us uh, for the site. Yeah. And that's true on news and that's, that's true on Buzz. And I think, you know, people see it as, the Buzz stuff as very, you know, friendly and open and that's good, but, like we do have sort of standards and separation. So, I mean, the basic tip is like read the stuff that people are doing and try to really tailor your pitch to see what we're doing to, to make it fit. Um, I know there were other hands up. How much time do we have? Probably like one more question. Okay, we got the mic back there. Hi, what do you think lists work so well on the web? I mean, just a matter of right. time because reading a list is much more faster than reading an article or whatever. What do we think BuzzFeed works uh, well? Yeah, why do we think lists work so oh, well lists. on the web? Oh. Sorry. Um, I don't think it's lists per se, because when BuzzFeed launched in the US, before it came to France, like French media saw lists, and then they all started doing lists, but like lists that are like five reasons to go see this movie, or like three reasons why this economic crisis is bad, and you're like, no. That, that, that is not, just putting a number in front of a title is not going to make your content good or appealing to people. So I don't know so much if it's the, like the number things, uh, but maybe like, maybe the number tells you quickly, like a big thing as BuzzFeed is telling quickly to the readers what they're going to get. Like not doing clickbait, being very clear about what they're going to get in the article. So if it's uh, 33 reasons why maple syrup is disgusting, <laughs> you what? know from reading it I am leaving <laughs> this is <laughs> what you're gonna get plus you know if you hate maple syrup you have found your people you Stop already know from the it. title and if you love it you can be very angry with the person so have, I think the number <laughs> just helps you like pitching it to the reader in a way would be my, uh, my view of it that's great thanks yeah. a lot <laughs>
<laughs> uh, anything you want to add about no, this? No. Same here. I think that it's not just the, the, the list. I think it's just what is on the list. I, I've seen a lot of media trying to do the same thing and they failed. So I think it's more about, yeah, the list uh, helps to show the content in a more clear way and maybe it's easy for mobile uh, mm, or, that's or true. Yeah. Yeah, mobile because you don't have to, it, it's, it, uh, it's easy to keep the attention at least because you know where you're reading and everything, but I, I think it's all about the content. I think that it doesn't matter if, if, if you put a bad content on a list, nobody's gonna read it anyway. Yeah, the, I think the mobile thing is a factor. More than 70% of our audience in Canada reads our stuff on phones. And the other thing about lists is we spend a lot of time choosing the right images. Like somebody will have a great idea for a list, but it will take them weeks or months until they find all of the right images that correctly represent all the points they have. And I think people underrate that. Um, and, and the humor in the writing. Yeah, right. like honestly, because uh, I, I do more buzz write, or do more news writing than buzz. Buzz is way harder than people think it is. Um, and the lists take a lot longer than you expect they do. And when we get freelance pitches, like we don't take a lot because the amount of time our buzz editor has to spend working with somebody on a list is it's often just not worth it for everyone involved, you know? Um, okay, I think we're, unfortunately we're out of time because there's another session at four, but we're around if you want to come say hi. Thank you everyone for coming. Thank you.